Hi, Lee, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jimmy. Great to be on your show. Lee, you've worked in the uranium industry for many years, and you've worked for many different companies in many different uranium producing countries throughout the world. And now as the CEO of NextGen, you're operating in the Athabasca Basin. And let's jump right into NextGen and tell us why it's so special. Yeah, well, look, we, we discovered based on all of that good work and the geological department in Saskatchewan has, and uh, it really did lead us to, to getting a, a good understanding of some uh, exploration portfolio that you now see in NextGen, which is the most dominant land position in the southwestern section of the basin. And very uniquely on the edge of the basin. So uh, in principle, if you're on the edge of the basin, you're likely to find deposits at their most shallow. Uh, as you go in the center of the basin, it starts to get deeper and deeper. And obviously uh, mineralization uh, will be less economic. But um, we strategically picked up that portfolio in uh, 2011 and 2012 and set about, uh, running additional geophysical surveys over it. And uh, just on that section of the, uh, of the Rook One property where Arrow's located on the Patterson corridor, we really did zero in on, on getting a, a sound understanding of the, the geo, geophysical signatures that existed. And uh, with the discovery of Triple R to the south of us along the Patterson corridor, um, we knew we were in the right district. and. Uh, and then we set about developing a, a number of targets. And on the very first drill hole on the, that uh, is now Arrow, uh, there had not been a drill hole within a four and a half kilometer radius of, of that target. Um, drilling on the property had previously occurred 30 years earlier. And uh, we hit it with the very first hole, which unprecedented. And uh, it's quite amazing when you consider, even though the deposits are very uh, large and high grade, they are extremely difficult to find, particularly in the basement rock setting. You can miss them by as little as one meter. Uh, that's how, how um, precise they are. But uh, Arrow very quickly showed its um, strength uh, where with the very third hole, we stepped out 200 meters and hit mineralization again. And so we knew we were onto a significant system uh, but how significant uh, time was time was to tell. And with the 15th hole at the property, we hit a very small slither, uh, about five centimetres width of very high grade mineralisation, which was indicative that we were near a um, very intense mineralising system. And then the 30th hole uh, in, in 2014, uh, at that time was ranked the fourth best in uranium exploration history. Uh, approximately 46 metres at over 10%. Uh, that hole now isn't in the top 20. It's fallen out of the top 20 holes and, and Arrow hosts uh, all of the others. Um, quite amazing. And, uh, and so the Arrow deposit has, has um, developed into what is the world's largest, uh, highest grade. And, and uh, given its technical characteristics of being in the confident basement rock, so we're in very sound ground conditions. It has a very clean metallurgy. And, and due to its grade, it's actually a very tiny footprint. It's actually going to be one of the world's tiniest underground mines at about 1300 tonnes per day. And so it has a very um, uh, elite environmental footprint, not only from its technical characteristics, but also the design parameters which we've put into it, um, where we've made environmental performance one of the, the top objectives with respect to our uh, execution of, of uh, development. Lee, 2021 has been a busy year for you and your team with the highlight being the release of the feasibility study earlier this year. Can you just provide some overview of that study and just give us a backdrop on the net present value, the internal rate of return and also the payback? Sure, so to put it into context, it, it's one of the most uh, economically powerful mineral resource projects in the world across any commodity. Um, for the gold bugs out there, it, it basically um, is averaging uh, over the life of the mine uh, about 75 grams per tonne gold equivalent. Uh, economically, it's an absolute powerhouse. 1.3, and this is all in Canadian dollars, uh, unless I state otherwise, 
uh, $1.3 billion Canadian CapEx figure. Uh, it has a payback period of 0.9 of a year. So extraordinarily quick payback period. And having worked on the other side of the fence, financing these types of projects, uh, I've never seen one like Arrow economically. It has an internal rate of return at, uh, at a $50 uranium price over the life of the mine. At, and we'll speak about where we see prices going in, in just a moment. But at a, a base case, $50 a pound over the life of the mine. It has a 52% after-tax IRR. And from a free cash flow perspective, over a billion dollars a year in after-tax free cash flow. Now, to put that into context, it'll take us into the top 15 mining companies worldwide on a free cash flow basis, yet uniquely coming from a single asset, which is one of the tiniest underground mines in the world with an elite environmental uh, uh, profile. And that's at just $50 a pound. So it's an incredible opportunity in an incredible jurisdiction. And uh, it, uh, you know, people throw out the terms uh, tier one. Uh, I think with those factors that I've just outlined, uh, I, I deem it the one. So those are very impressive economics based on $50 uranium. But as we both know, the average contract price for uranium was in the last cycle was $75. What happens to the economics then? Yeah, at well, seventy-five dollars, we will elevate from the top fifteen into the top ten, if not top five. And uh, when we saw uranium go to seven, well, in that average contracting price last time, and we uh, we do have it on a table there and showing the sensitivities of the project. Well, the economic returns just um, go to another another level. Um, yet the mine and the footprint stay the same and the sovereign location all stay the same. And so when you when you put that into context, what an incredible opportunity it is for the province of Saskatchewan and also the country of Canada um, uh, it, that we have in front of us. And overlaid on top of that, we're actually generating a commodity which is going to be the, the base of clean air energy fuel worldwide. And it's great to see the pandemic. Feels like we're almost through it as a as a as a as a planet. Um, the next issue that we really do have to face is the the clean air environment, and to have not just an incredible mining project, um, but to have that overlaid over the top of it, that's going to be positive for so many people around the globe. Um, that's why the team at Next Gen is so committed. We certainly see the responsibility that we have in front of us to do this exceptionally well. And uh, the team is, is dedicated to that objective. And so economically, environmentally, um, socially, it, it's, it's such an incredible uh, opportunity and privilege that, that we all have at NextGen in uh, coming to work every day. Lee, the average annual production for the first five years will be 28.8 million pounds of uranium. And over the life of mine, it will be 21.7 million pounds. Can you just put that into perspective for us? How does that compare to Cameco? Yes. So that uh, production number is based on our feasibility study, which is based purely on the measured and indicated resources. We have an, an additional 80 million pounds in the inferred category that with extra drilling will we'll transfer into the measured and indicated. So you'll, you'll see that production profile change as we're in production, it'll, it'll expand and go for longer. Um, that will take us to, uh, based on those numbers and based on 2019 mined production, which is the last full year of, of production prior to the pandemic would make us around 20% of the world's uh, production. When we look at the production profile of the existing mines around the world, um, I actually think by the time we are in production in the um, early part of the latter part of this decade, um, you'll see that as a higher percentage than 20% than at those numbers. And, and I, I really wanna be clear with this point for everyone listening is that the production profile of mined production is decreasing between now and when next gen's going into production. And those, those production numbers of, of uh, 28 million pounds per annum is still not going to meet the, 
the production that is coming offline between now and then. So Arrow is just really going to um, address some of the, the production which is coming offline, let alone the gap between demand and supply in the latter part of this decade. And look, the world's gonna need three to four arrows um, online in the latter part of this decade. And uh, and so, yeah, I know on your show, you've got a number of the other companies here with, with Vision and, and Denison as well, um, uh, undergoing development of, of their uranium projects in the Athabasca Basin. And we all, you know, we're all at different stages and offer something different, but uh, it's an incredible opportunity for a number of companies, not just next gen. And uh, it's uh, full credit to um, the companies that you have on your show because they're the ones that have been in there, you know, since the early 2000s, con con continuous, continuously, and and have really shown a lot of resilience and dedication to uh, what we have, you know, uh, we're on the cusp of. Lee, that's a great overview of the feasibility study and the economics. Let's move on. Another aspect to the next gen story is the exploration upside because you and your team have only explored a very small part and you haven't done much exploration in the last couple of years because you've been focused on the feasibility study. But you did announce the new exploration program in July. Why don't we just touch on that and tell us how many meters you're drilling, how many rigs do you have going? Yeah, that's right, Jimmy. Um, we we did. We haven't drilled for two years. We've only recently reinitiated uh, re that campaign with two drill rigs. Uh, you, you you quite rightly point out. We look. We hit Arrow with the very first uh, hole uh, on that target. It was actually the 21st hole on the property um, that we'd ever drilled. It's an enormous property as well. And we're just talking about the Patterson Corridor alone where we've only really explored 10% of the Pat Patterson Corridor. But we've actually got another eight corridors on the Rook One property, which uh, we haven't even touched. So we've got 90% of the Patterson Corridor, but we've got another eight of nine uh, corridors on the property, which we haven't even touched yet, which is, look, for everyone looking at looking at the the profile of the property it's clearly the most prospective on the planet for uranium uh, mineralization and so we uh with the engineering study uh completed in february of 2021 we're on the uh, final stages of drafting our environmental impact study uh it was time to reinitiate the the exploration campaign i want to be clear here we are bold uh, perspective here. We are not looking just to incrementally increase arrow. We are looking for new arrows with these two drill rigs. And so one of the areas we're looking at is below the arrow mineralization because there's a geological basis that uh, arrow is the, the top of a much broader system at depth. Um, no, if we are to discover anything down there, uh, it's going to take time to develop because it, it's below arrow and, and uh, below a thousand meters, but it'll be highly economic now that we've established the arrow deposit on its own with all that infrastructure in place, et cetera. Any type of mineralization that we find from here is going to be highly beneficial to the, uh, to, uh, to the project and investors. And so we're looking underneath arrow. We're also looking uh, along strike from arrow at a couple of areas which we, we have uh, poked some holes in in the past, but uh, back in 2015, but that's when Arrow was going, you know, developing at such a rate of knots, we we pulled the rigs prematurely and brought them to Arrow to help define up the resource. So there's a, there's a number of targets that we've been, you know, uh, the, the geological department's been pressuring us to get back to as soon as they can, and, and we'll be touching on those uh, during this campaign. The campaign is 12,000 metres, 6,000 of it under Arrow um, and uh, and the balance on the regional uh, targets along the Patterson Corridor. But I, I think you, know, you can see us having uh, at least two rigs operating continuously uh, throughout 2022 um, because look, it, it, uh, it, there's so many targets um, and we, we would like to have a, 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 a full understanding of what we're dealing with here, but look, to give us some context, we could have 10 rigs drilling for 10 years, 24 seven, 365 days a year, and still not 
complete the full geological assessment of the Rook One property. It's uh, it's that extensive. So as you said earlier, you have measured and indicated reserves of 210 million, another 80 million pounds in inferred. And like you said, you have only drilled 10% of the Patterson Lake corridor. So what's the blue sky? Oh, it, uh, it's enormous. Uh, I think there's undoubtedly, you know, the history of exploration on the property, how quickly we hit what is the world's, you know, largest, highest grade uranium project. It's an in, incredible environmental setting. Um, yeah, I, I think it's enormous. And uh, one, one, one point I'd, I'd also make is that, look, the MPV of Arrow is incredible. Um, and the way things are moving though, and, and the, the value that is getting placed on companies that are generating like uh, very good environments for the, for the earth, yeah, I, I think there's a bit of a shift towards weighting the value of a company towards its its ESG component, and and I think not only is the MPV impressive of next gen, but that ESG component is as well. And I think you're going to see that that uh, value uh, over time. And uh, you know, it's we're in the very very early days of our company's development. Lee, that's a great overview. And now I want to move on to your balance sheet and also your shareholders. You're cashed up with over $200 million. How are you going to allocate that capital? Yes, we have $200 million, uh, in cash uh, as we speak. We uh, have ongoing the environmental uh, impact study, which we're nearing completion. We've got front-end engineering design, which uh, we've currently initiated, which will you know, get the design level to a very fine level of detail. And then we also, in our feasibility study, showed that we, there was 158 million of pre-commitment uh, capital works, such as an airstrip uh, surface clearing. We've actually even started that um, over the course of the, the third quarter of 2021 with very detailed uh, geotechnical drilling for the foundations, um, for the mill and, and the mine. And so you'll see that um, continually uh, executed uh, over the, the uh, 2022 and uh, and so we're well funded into 2024 with all of our current uh, plans and, and objectives and uh, looking forward to uh, to getting into it. So in March you did a raise of 172 million dollars and a lot has happened since then but how did that raise go? Did you see a lot of new institutions come in and if so where were they from? Were they U.S. or uh, Europeans? Yeah, it, it, it's a very good aspect of, of that. We, look, we experienced back in November of last year with uh, Boris Johnson uh, very clearly committing to uh, nuclear energy. I see this morning that uh, he's announced that their energy will be fully renewable or nuclear by 2035. Uh, then Biden uh, became president of the United States, doubled down on clean air energy uh, with a very strong commitment to nuclear energy. And, and around that time, we started receiving a lot of inbound calls from ESG funds and, and generalist funds. And uh, that's never happened um, in, in uh, well, my career, which uh, started in uranium back in 2002. And, and those calls have been growing and growing over time um, or since November of last year, because it, it really does feel like the appreciation for just the power of nuclear energy in terms of generating baseload um, electricity uh, without uh, emitting carbon emissions is, uh, is, is really getting accepted based on the science, finally, which is, which is the key here. And so we've had a lot more calls from ESG funds and also generalist funds uh, since November of last year. And the 172 million that we raised uh, in uh, March of 2021, we had a number of new entrants um, into uh, on the share registry. Also, with Lee Kaohsiung uh, CEF Holdings uh, converting their debt uh, to equity, uh, currently have 19.9% uh, of the uh, of the company, but we have all of their voting rights. Um, I think over the last 12 months, you've seen our share registry become less uh, dominated by mining focused 
investors and with a higher percentage of generalist and ESG focused investors uh, entering in the story. Well, you raise a very good point there because I think people are waking up to the fact that even though you talk about renewable energy and it sounds good, wind and solar alone aren't going to cut it. Solar's only, um, you can only generate power from solar 20 to 30 percent of the time, whereas nuclear goes 24 7. Yes, exactly. And I, I, I think there's been no better test than a pandemic to show the value of, of nuclear energy, how it stood up um, even during a pandemic. And uh, look, technologies uh, for wind and solar need to continue to be developed, etc. But it, it, you've just hit the key point, Jimmy. Today and forecast for the next 10 to 20 years, that technology in wind and solar needs to really develop before it can be heavily relied upon. You've got to have a, a, a mix of energy sources and, and in terms of base load and um, carbon free, it's, it's nuclear energy or hydro if the, if the landscape uh, nearby a city um, facilitates it. So you touched on this earlier, but you said your next big permit is the environmental impact statement. And remind me again, when is that due? So we are in the final stages of drafting our uh, environmental impact study. Uh, it's a large document, but, it, but it's one we've been working on for over five years, uh, incorporating all the data dating back to 2013. And we're in the final stages of that. Uh, we'll be submitting that shortly after uh, it's completed at the end of this year. And then uh, we'll be undergoing the uh, regulatory review process. But um, it's fair to say we've been working side by side with the regulators for that last five years. They've got a very good understanding of what they're about to receive. And really to put that in the context, the EIS is formal documentation of that process that we've already gone through. So uh, we're looking forward, it's a, going to be a very significant milestone for the company. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, having that submitted. And then uh, there'll be a public review period. And, uh, and, uh, and then um, uh, approval thereafter. So once you get all your permits, what's the best case scenario in terms of timing for construction and then ultimately production? Well, it, it, it's another good point, Jimmy. We will be uh, uh, executing on our pre-commitment early works, that $158 million worth of spending in parallel to that permitting process. We are extremely confident with the permitting process based on all of our feedback. And uh, we are doing that with confidence. So the permitting process uh, can take a, a period of time. Uh, it won't inhibit the pre-commitment early works that I've I've discussed. Um, and so the construction time for the project is 46 months. And uh, so when will we'll be precisely in, in uh, production time will will tell, but we're extremely confident for the, the early part of, of this latter part of the decade, um, post 2025, um, somewhere in the latter part of that decade, but we're very confident it'll be in the earlier part of, of, of the latter half. And so um, uh, we look forward to going through this process. We've got enormous confidence around it. Uh, the government's um, support for the company and the project as well is, is very well understood and, and also the local communities as well. So it, um, it's an exciting period for, for uh, everyone and all stakeholders. Um, the, the population of Saskatchewan and Canada and um, yeah, we, we uh, are very excited about it. We've seen a lot of m and I want to digress now from NextGen and, and get your thoughts on m and We've seen a lot of this in the precious metals uh, sector here in the last couple of years, but we haven't seen any in uranium. And given that we just came out of this low point in the cycle where prices were very distressed, are you surprised we haven't seen some of the majors come in and, and buy some of the developers or Explorcos? Yeah, look, it's, it's an interesting point. And uh, look, I, I think with uranium being so flat for 10 years, and it's only recently with the, the Sprott Uranium Trust initiating or, or launching a mechanism that is going to lead to a, 
greater price um, transparency, which I think is in the interest of all uh, market participants. Uh, I think you will see that that interest increase um, as uh, over the coming period. Um, uranium has been at historically low levels, um, but um, you know, with the supply demand and supply situation the way it is, I think you're going to see larger entrants, and not just from a an economic point of view, but also you know, from a green energy point of view, um, battery metals, clean energy. Um, I think you're going to see more interest from those major mining companies that uh, not only are in uranium but also uh, not in uranium. And I think uniquely, Arrow you know, is the first first time there's been an asset like us which in uranium hasn't required any level of sophistication. Um, it's in competent basement rock with, with a very clean metallurgy in an incredible. Uh, environmental setting and sovereign location and with the um, movement so heavily weighted towards ESG reporting uh, I think it's just uh, around the corner the other aspect which I think is interesting is look oil companies um, have enormous pressure on them to uh, improve their carbon emitting profile uranium mining it's a fuel, energy fuel, uh, and it can help uh, offset a lot of that carbon emitting um, aspect from, from producing oil. Lee, as we wrap up, what can shareholders expect in, in terms of news flow here in the coming weeks and months from NextGen? Yes, we, we actually have our maiden sustainability report in the final stages of, of drafting as well. So that will be based on 2020 numbers where Look, we had a pandemic activities at site were very, very minimal, uh, but it, it's going to provide investors a real foundation as to how you know we are uh, uh, conducting ourselves. And I think we have one of the best ESG stories in the entire sector. And, and so uh, that's going to be a, an excellent document, which is to be published shortly. Finalization of the EIS, one of the most major milestones in, in the company's history today. Uh, that's just around the corner. And we've got two drill rigs drilling consistently. If we hit any type of mineralization, it's going to be material and we'll be coming to the market with it. And so, uh, yeah, we've got a number of aspects on, on, uh, at the company which uh, is going to generate um, news flow uh, consistently um, from now um, going into the, into the future. And so incredibly exciting time at the company. And, uh, and I, I should also add, we're continually building the team as well. Um, and uh, so that's exciting as well. And uh, both uh, predominantly in, in Saskatoon, but uh, we've also recently engaged uh, some, some um, uh, executives that are in other parts of the world, um, closer to the markets, the, the nuclear fuel markets. And so uh, it's a very exciting time. Well, Lee, that's a great overview of the Next Gen story, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us today. To all the viewers, if you have any further questions for Lee and his team, send us an email to info at bloorstreetcapital.com, and we'll get you an answer. Or if you would like some research on Next Gen, send us an email, and we'll send it along. Lee, once again, thank you for making the time today. Thank you very much, Jimmy. appreciate your support and all the investors' support.